Hi and welcome to Orbit. What are the challenges if you want to build a premium product but one that is environmentally friendly as well? I had the chance to talk to Apple about this exact topic and here are their answers. This is John Turnus. He is the Vice President of Hardware Engineering at Apple and this is Lisa Jackson. She's the woman on top of the Apple Park and responsible for all environmental questions at Apple. Kelly, it is so lovely to be here in such a beautiful place um, and to spend a couple of minutes just catching you up on Apple's environmental plans. Um, I think you know that Apple has been running on renewable energy since 2018 and in 2020 we announced that we were carbon neutral for our entire company. But it was also the year of the Paris Climate Accord and we wanted to challenge ourselves to go farther and faster than any, anyone we knew, but really even than we thought we could go. And so we announced Apple 2030. And Apple 2030 is, means for us that every single product we sell by the year 2030 must be carbon neutral. Now, what does it mean for a product to be carbon neutral, right? So for a product to be carbon neutral, of course, when John and his team design and engineer these wonderful products, they have to be manufactured and our supply chain has to be running on clean energy. So, so far we have 250 of our suppliers who make up almost 85% of our total spend or have committed to run on clean energy for Apple production. It's a wonderful transformation and it means there's 13 gigawatts of new clean energy coming on grids around the world to supply their needs. So we're really proud of that. We have more to go, but it's the vast majority of the money we spend already. We're seeing our suppliers rise to the challenge. Um, but then there's another piece of making a product really carbon neutral, and that is when you take it home and you use it, you have to charge it. And that energy needs to be clean as well to really be carbon neutral. And it's our responsibility because we sold you the product. And so we're also adding clean energy around the world on grids to cover our customers' use of our product. So that way you can feel really great that the product is, um, is really not impacting the climate. Um, how are we doing? You know, we also want to be really clear. Most of what we want to do, we'll get there by changing to clean energy, by cutting the carbon footprint. But still, there's a, there will be some carbon footprint that we cannot control. Things like shipping are a great example. Maybe in the future we'll come up with some more breakthroughs. But in the meantime, we know we have to remove carbon from the air. And our favorite type of removal is actually nature-based. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, trees, as they grow, sequester carbon. They absorb carbon from the air and emit oxygen. And we love that simple machinery of a tree, if you will. Uh, we also invest in um, blue carbon, mangroves, and grasslands. Um, and so all those together will get us to carbon neutral by 2030. Our carbon footprint is already down 45% since 2015, yeah. at a time when our revenue is up um, 68%. And so we're starting to feel pretty confident that we have separated our carbon emissions from how our business is doing. Our business can do well, but it doesn't require us to raise our emissions in the process. Wow, okay, a lot of my questions are already <laughs> oh, answered. No. <laughs> How does Apple plan to further reduce the carbon footprint? Like you did a lot of great steps already, but what are your next big goals? What, what do you tackle next? Yeah, a lot of what has to happen next will depend on the wonderful engineers on John's team because it's about low carbon design. It's about low carbon materials. So if you combine a product that's designed to use as little energy as possible, and then you make it with materials that are low carbon footprint themselves, those two come together to actually drive the carbon footprint of the product down. So besides working with our suppliers, which we will continue to do, a lot of our strategy is really built around the idea that recycled materials have a much lower carbon footprint than materials that are virgin materials that come from ores and from mining. And so John's team has really taken up the challenge of trying to one day make all of our products from recycled and renewable materials. Mm. If we get there, combined with all the work on clean energy, then 2030 is, 
is easily within our sights. Nice. So it's maybe even earlier. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't want to promise to that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think it will be midnight on December 30th. <laughs> so as you mentioned, you're already using a lot of recycled materials, but what are the other challenges when developing a new product like you want it to be premium and nice and fast and all that stuff but you also want it to be environment friendly how how does that contract is that like does it how does it work what are the challenges yeah i, I think uh you know as you said there, there is a big question how do you make something that that is carbon neutral and, and the way our engineers approach each project every product we want to have a lower carbon footprint than its predecessor we're just kind of working our way down but we're also a bit greedy because we want to have it all we still want the products to be apple products so we want safe reliable high quality products that have that apple experience and, and what's great is we found through a lot of hard work and innovation we can actually have both and and i can give you some examples of that we um energy efficiency is probably one of the best examples you know many years ago we started making our own silicon for iphone And what we found is, you know, within an iPhone, it's a constrained product. So if you want to have more performance and capability, the only way to get there is to get more performance per watt, right? You can't, you can't do too much power in a, in a phone. And so the team has just been relentless on pushing more and more performance per watt. We were then able to scale that up with a little more power to like an iPad and have amazing performance in a tablet form factor. And then most recently with, with our Apple, Sil Apple Silicon transition to the Mac, um, it's just transformed the Mac experience, right? The machines are, are incredibly fast, they're quiet, MacBook Airs don't even have fans. Mm -hmm. um, the battery life, you get 22 hours on a MacBook Pro. And, and actually, what great thing is, you know, a big you, part of that team is, is in Germany, is in Munich. We have a couple thousand engineers that have been instrumental in driving that power efficiency and helping us get to these products mm -hmm. for, for phone and iPad and Mac. And so that's a great way where the products get better, But of course, they use less power. So ultimately, you know, we're getting far, you know, closer and closer to our 2030 goals by lowering that that overall energy use. Another good example, which we talked about, is recycling. Um, you know, which when we're specifying materials for a product, you think of aluminum for a for a MacBook Air. We have really demanding requirements. We want it to be beautiful, strong, good thermal conductivity, everything we need in, a, in an alloy. And what happens when you, when you bring in a recycled material stream, you tend to bring in some amount of kind of trace contaminants that mm. can impact the material properties. So in order for us to do what we did a few years ago, which is get to 100% recycled aluminum in the, in the MacBook Air enclosure, we had to design a completely new aluminum alloy where the composition was such that a little bit of contaminant didn't affect the material properties. And so we built our own alloy so that we could bring in that recycled material and achieve our goals without compromising what makes a MacBook Air a MacBook yeah, Air. Can't tell which is recycled and not recycled. Yeah, you can't tell. And that was the goal, yeah. right? We want it, we, we don't want to take anything away. We want, like I said, we want to have it all. Mm. Um, another huge area for us that I think really benefits both our customers and the environment is the way we focus on durability of our products, right? We want to build products that last. And, and you see it, I think, in the, in the value that our, our products continue to have over time, right? iPhones, after three years, that are worth, on average, 80% more than a comparable Android device because they're built to last. And so a tremendous amount of work goes into the design. When we, when we do our, our new phone developments, throughout the course of that development, we test thousands and we break thousands and thousands of phones to try to find issues fix them so that when we ship the product it is the you know the most durable product that we can make on the materials side you know we created ceramic shield which is on the uh, the cover that's the most robust cover on on any smartphone and again it's, it's had a huge impact in terms of minimizing you know returns and repairs mm -hmm. and things like that and so our goal is to, like i said to build a product that lasts because mm -hmm. ultimately the best repair is the repair you never have to have, right? Makes sense, yeah. And so, but there are times when you do have to repair things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we take a really data-driven approach to that. We want to focus on making sure our customers have easy access to repair for the things that are most likely to require repair. So mm -hmm. easy access for a screen repair or on the iPhone 14 last year, we redesigned the entire phone to what we call a mid-chassis architecture so that the rear glass could be separable, which makes it a lot easier to repair if somebody does break the, the mm -hmm. rear glass. But we also think a lot about making sure we're, we're not, sometimes there can be a bit of a conflict between the durability and the repairability, right? Mm -hmm. You can make an internal component more repairable by having it discrete and removable, but that actually inherently adds 
a potential failure point. And so yeah. by using the data, we can understand what are the parts of the phone that need to be repaired and which are the ones where it's actually better just to make them so robust that they never need to be repaired. Mm. So it's always kind of a, a balance. Sense, that yeah. Yeah. When I think about the accessories for the iPhone or the Apple mm -hmm. Watch, they're fabrics, they're silicone, yeah. Yeah. but there are some leather products as well. And do you think about maybe like your partner Hermes, they're choosing mushroom leather now, like stuff like that. Is this something Apple is thinking about or well, I can never talk about any yeah, future products, yeah, yeah. but I, but I can see you, you you're very right in that we have an incredible materials team, mm -hmm. and that's you know the, the the alloy engineers who focus on our aluminum and and steel and and of course we do so much work in glass, and we also do a lot of work in textiles and other materials, and we're always pushing to kind of take that forward and find more kind of environmentally friendly solutions for every material and better mm -hmm. recyclability for every material. So it's a it's a journey that we're always working our way through. Okay. Um, Lisa, how much CO2 does an iPhone roughly emit? Like, like when you buy the product, what is the yeah. amount? Is um, I actually don't know the number for iPhone 14 off the top of my head, but every single product that we emit, we put out an environmental product report for mm -hmm. it. And so you can look online and we can look right now <laughs> <laughs> together if you want and find out exactly what phone you're looking at and what the carbon footprint is. Oh, nice. And we do that because we want to be transparent about each individual product because for a customer, they're not interested necessarily in the whole footprint. Mm. They want to know what, what they are contributing. Yeah. What, did you, what would you say is like a good step people can take if they want to buy new tech, but they also want to be sustainable, like they want to have a good environmental footprint. What can people do if they're interested in tech, but they like the environment as well? <laughs> Listen, it's, we want you interested in tech, <laughs> yeah. but we've thought about that. And of course, tech is about what I call the new hotness. You want necessarily some of the features or the performance that's being designed into our products, but that's why we made the trade-in program. And I can't emphasize enough that because it rests on the fact that we make such long lasting, durable devices. We do that on purpose because they have a long life. They hold their value. So if you've decided for whatever reason that you need to have the new um, uh, model of the device, come in, bring it in, please trade it in. Unless you want to give it to someone you love or someone you like, mm -hmm. uh, that's fine too. But if you do that, then we can have Either we, with our recycling robots, Daisy and Dave and Taz, yeah. we can recycle it if it's an iPhone, if it's not, if it's another piece of hardware. We'll send it to be recycled, refurbished, and then it will be resold. It will go back into the world to continue being used. So the very best thing you can do with technology and be sustainable is continue to use it. Use it for as long as possible. And if it doesn't meet your needs anymore, because your needs have advanced someone else needs that technology mm -hmm. and we're pretty excited about the opportunity for us to continue to grow as a company reach more customers mm -hmm. and meet them wherever they are in their technology needs mm -hmm. but i think maybe i can add one thing which is as we were saying before with each product we're lowering our carbon footprint so i think customers can feel really good about buying also about buying that new product because they know that it is, you know, it is even more efficient. It is even lower carbon footprint than the than the predecessor. If if a customer is still using a pre Apple Silicon Mac, for example, well, a new Apple Silicon based Mac is going to use dramatically less power, mm -hmm. and is actually going to be a you know a really really great story. And they can feel really good about that. I just switched from a Mac Pro Intel base uh -huh. to the Mac Studio, and it's like seven times less. Power, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, 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 it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it feels pretty good to use, huh? Yeah, that's fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can get those materials back and use it to make the next map. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when the EU decided to uh, support USB-C and forced every company to use, to use USB-C, Apple claimed that they will do it as mm -hmm. well on the future. But now they are talking about removal batteries and easier to repair products. Does this make the products worse in some way or does it enhance them? Like, are you happy when something like this comes up or is it like, is it way more complicated than just, oh, we throw in some tools, replace it yourself? I, I think it is It is complicated, right? And 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 I think it's important that, that we continue to have these conversations because as I talked about before, I mean, maybe a good example is our iPhones are IP68, right? They're incredibly water resistant. And we always get these great stories where customers tell us how they accidentally dropped their phone into a body of water like that. And it took them two days to get it out. And they're so excited because it's still working. 
but to to get that level of of kind of water resistance there's a lot of highly engineered adhesives and seals to to keep it all watertight but of course that makes it a little more difficult to open up so there's there's a balance there so we absolutely believe that if people need you know a battery replacement there should be a, a safe and an effective way to do that and we've been enabling that through our various you know certainly through our apple stores but also our service partners um, but but i think it's we always need to make sure we're balancing the the durability with that repairability mm. when you joined Apple at 2001. Uh -huh. Apple was a company with the colorful products and transparency and stuff uh -huh. like that. And then you joined and now the products look much more industrial. I always wondered why was that change? Like, saying was it me? No, nah, <laughs> I'm saying it was you. But why did you decide like as a company and now without like a head of design, I think there's like the chief design officer right now. There's, mm -hmm. there's none, right? So how do you decide on what direction you go with the hardware design? Oh, we, we, we have an incredible industrial design team. We, we, we always have and we still have, it, it's just an amazing team that's always working very closely with the hardware engineering team in a, in a very collaborative way, right? I think in, in some other places you might have a design team that sketches up an idea and then they give it to engineering and they have to go and execute. And we actually are working together from the very beginning. And and there's a lot of things that, that drive design, but some of it is also just our capabilities, you know, our ability to, to produce things in, in really high quality, you know, aluminum and steel and glass. Like we have gotten so much more capable in the 22 years that, that I've been there. Um, that's opened the door for us to build products in a way that that, quite frankly, we never could have done that in, in 2001. So, um, but we're always looking and pushing and, and, and evolving. And I think um, as new products come out, you always see like new ideas and new designs and new materials. And so that's one of the things that makes it such a fun place to work is that there's always something new to try. No and version we, pro, like. And exactly. we're really grateful on our side because aluminum is a highly recyclable material. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I love those old days, but that was an awful lot of plastic. And so for us, it is actually more sustainable because yeah, now we're talking about a lot of recyclable material. It's great to know. Yeah. Thank you for the time. Oh, thank you yeah. for the answers. Yeah. Killian, this was fun. fun. <laughs> I like your shoes. Back. Let's see. Oh, what yeah, look at that. Colorful, yeah, love you nights. Nice. <laughs> That's really cool. As you can see, a lot of interesting answers from Apple, and I'm personally am glad to see that a huge company like Apple is doing so much for the environment already, even more than the law requires them to do, because it influences positively not only Apple, but all of the small companies that use maybe the similar supply chain. So that's it from this video. I hope it was interesting to you, and I see you in the next one. Bye.